Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, trends and opinions from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening we're joined by Cam Edwards of NRA News. And Cam, we're glad to have you on the show. Chris, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And so, NRA News, tell us a little bit about what that is. So, NRA News is uh, a, a website. Uh, it's also a brand that is devoted to covering the latest Second Amendment news and information. Uh, my role at NRA News is to host a show called Cam and Company, uh, which is a three hour a day, five day a week program that is your first source for Second Amendment news and information, whether it's national news, local news, we're covering everything from ballot initiatives like the ones we have here in California, uh, to what's going on on Capitol Hill, to what's going on around the globe when it comes to the right to keep and bear arms. So the, the foundational question is, where did you just go from liking guns to actually being an advocate and getting involved with the NRA and then they let you on media to talk about it. <laughs> talk to us about how that happened. So in 2004 when NRA News launched I was uh, working in Oklahoma City which is where I grew up uh, hosting morning drive radio on the news talk station there and uh, was approached with the opportunity to, to start this program. Um, this was really exciting to me because it was the opportunity to really delve into one issue as opposed to kind of flitting about and, and covering a story for 30 seconds at a time, I'd actually focus on an issue that, that is really important, not just to me, but to tens of millions of Americans. And this was something really unique. Nobody was doing anything like this before. Um, even today, I don't think there's another three hour daily program that focuses on this particular issue. So it was, it was a really neat opportunity. Obviously, uh, you know, the NRA is a hugely important institution, I think, in American life. It's more popular than uh, both presidential candidates right now. It's more popular than uh, Congress and a lot of the institutions that you see in Washington. Uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of Americans who support what the NRA does, and to be a part of this and to, uh, to reach those members and to reach that audience on a daily basis, it was really just a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Well, it's interesting because the NRA has a bad name in some circles and a great name in others, and there are a lot of myths that go along with NRA. But the thing that shocks me is that you're able to, for five days a week, three hours a day, and I, you know, going to the range is too expensive for me to even shoot for three hours, let alone talk about guns for 15 hours a week. What kind of content do you cover in that time frame? So a typical day, for example, um, we'll talk on tomorrow's program. It uh, looks like we're going to see anti-gun activists uh, go up to Capitol Hill once again, try to raise trouble, try to uh, uh, drum up support for votes on gun control. We'll be covering that. Uh, we also have a veto override session in Missouri right now where the governor has vetoed some pro-gun legislation. Uh, the legislature is meeting to try to override those vetoes. We're paying attention to the presidential election as well as you know Senate races. Uh, we also have daily features. So we do a, an armed citizen story every day. We have an armed citizen story that the national media typically doesn't cover. Uh, we also have a story, and California is featured quite often in this segment, uh, what we call the deal of the day, where it's a career criminal who's not been prosecuted. The laws aren't fully enforced. And so here you have somebody who has been in repeated contact with the law uh, and has never really done any significant prison time or, or incarceration time. Uh, and goes on to commit more crimes. So we highlight those types of stories. We also have a uh, feature that we call the good guy of the day, and that's someone who's not necessarily law enforcement, although we do have a lot of law enforcement officers who end up in this, but somebody who just does something good for the community because we don't see a lot of those stories out there. Mm -hmm. So not only are we covering Second Amendment news and information, but I think we also are covering, I like to call them uh, freedom-related issues. But uh, I guess maybe a shorthand version is these are, are news stories that are important to gun owners, uh, even if they don't necessarily have a, a direct Second Amendment connection. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because what we see on the regular, the traditional media are kind of the, the um, uh, hyping up of mass killings and all of these kinds of things. But it sounds like through armed citizen types of stories, you're probably covering the ones where the, the guys were stopped before it became mass killings or before anyone who should not have been taken out does. Talk to us a little bit for people who don't know what an armed citizen kind of sure. story is about. Well, a lot of these defensive gun uses um, don't even result in a trigger being pulled. The, the presence of that firearm is enough to prevent that crime from escalating. Mm -hmm. So an, an attempted armed robbery remains an attempted armed robbery rather than a successful armed robbery. Mm -hmm. uh, a home invasion is thwarted because a homeowner 
has a firearm and can repel those home invaders, can defend themselves. Um, one of the stories that just really sticks out to me was a uh, woman, a police officer actually in Ohio. Uh, this was uh, last year. Um, she was at home alone, off duty. Her ex-boyfriend shows up, starts assaulting her. She manages to get to a phone. She calls 911. Uh, while officers are en route, this guy is, he's going to kill her. Uh, she is able to break away, she's able to run, get her firearm, defend herself. It's a, it's a terrifying story. Uh, a lot of these stories really are scary. You know, nobody wakes up as a gun owner and thinks, I really hope today is the day that I get to use my gun, right? right? Any more than anybody who owns a fire extinguisher thinks, I really hope today is the day my kitchen catches on fire, or I really hope today is the day I get to put my car insurance to good use, right? We don't think about it that way. But when those moments occur, um, it's good to have that firearm. It's good to be able to defend yourself. And so we highlight these stories that really, again, you know, a lot of them, they don't end up in the national media because they're not mass shootings, because they're not uh, huge stories, but they're one individual saving one life or their, their life and the lives of their kids because they had access to a firearm. And interestingly, your topic for tonight at the forum where you'll be speaking is about gun ownership being a human right. Talk to me about where that comes from. So self-defense as a human right is something that I've been saying for a couple of years now because uh, a few years ago, the United Nations, a special rapporteur for human rights named Barbara Fry, uh, wrote a report in which she said that self-defense is not a human right. As a matter of fact, it's just a legal construct. And so you can have states that, uh, that recognize self-defense, you can have states that don't recognize self-defense, and uh, neither one is violating or promoting human rights. Uh, she went on to say that, that gun control actually is a human right. And if you don't have restrictive uh, policies, even more restrictive than what you had in Washington, D.C. during the handgun ban or uh, even California, uh, that you are in fact violating people's rights by refusing to keep them safe. And I thought that was so preposterous given what we know about uh, how violent crime works, who's committing violent crimes, uh, it, the idea that if we you know, just pass more gun control laws, we'll all be safer. Look, it didn't work in Washington, D.C. It didn't work in Chicago. Frankly, it's not working in California, where last year Los Angeles saw 126% increase in aggravated assaults. You know, this gets beyond, I think, the, uh, the, the debate over public safety. And it, gets, it boils it down to, again, that individual right. Do you have a right? To protect yourself when your life is threatened. We have police officers who are sworn to protect and serve the community, uh, but when it comes to our individual lives, that responsibility, I think, is ultimately up to us. Right. And we should have a right to exercise that. I, I don't know how you can't have that <laughs> right. I, you know, it seems to me that if you don't have that right, well, the, what you're saying is that, that your life uh, ultimately uh, isn't worth protecting, that, uh, you know, is, it may be a tragedy, it may be a shame if you lose your life, but, uh, but, but you don't have that, that right to, to save it? I, that that seems, seems mind boggling to me. Yeah, it's, it's, it is very interesting that people have the right to tell you that you can't have a firearm, um, and you have the right to be offended if they're killed with a firearm, but they don't have the right to defend themselves with a firearm as well. It's, it, it doesn't make sense to me either. And you know, we're starting to see this, I think, play out in a lot of different areas. So there's a, uh, there's a movement called Black Guns Matter, <laughs> um, based out of North Philadelphia. A, a activist named Maj Ture uh, has been working on this program for about a year or so now. He actually is now taking it on the road, went to Baltimore uh, this past weekend. And it's all about, again, educating people about what their rights are, uh, how to be a responsible gun owner, uh, conflict de-escalation, so what, do you, what can you do so that you don't have to use a firearm? Right. Um, you also are seeing you know, a lot of attention being paid to groups like the Pink Pistols uh, in the aftermath of the massacre at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. Mm -hmm. There are um, a lot of members of the LGBT community who are deciding, you know what, I want to become a gun owner. I want to become a concealed carry holder. I want to be able to protect myself. Right. And a lot of this now is you know, engaging in the outreach so that members of these communities know and understand you don't have to feel uncomfortable, you don't have to feel scared or nervous about going to a gun store or a range. You're gonna be welcomed. People are, are there to help. Uh, because what we've heard time and time again is people say, why well, I, I was interested, I was curious, but I didn't know how I would, how I would be received. Mm -hmm. And I want people to know that if, if you're out there uh, you know, trying to exercise your rights, you will get help 
uh, from people in the gun owning community. You will you will get that support that you want and that you need. Yeah, my experience has always been they're very enthusiastic to show you how their weapon works and even sometimes let you spend a few rounds. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so that you can get hooked along with them. Absolutely. So we were talking before the show about places, for example, like Venezuela, where firearm ownership has been considered illegal. And so you would expect, great, no guns are allowed, crime is probably non-existent now. What's the reality? You know, it's funny because we hear a lot of politicians uh, bring up Australia, right? Well, look at what Australia did. They had a gun buyback and then the homicide rates declined. And why can't we just be like Australia? They never talk about other countries like Venezuela that banned civilian possession of firearms in 2012. Caracas is now the most violent city in the world. Now, there are a lot of other problems, obviously, in Venezuela. But the, the simple passage of a law that says you can't legally own a gun anymore has done nothing to make the average Venezuelan safer because the government still has the guns, the Maduro-supported gangs still have the guns, the criminals still have the guns, but if you have gone through the process and you've gotten your permit and you did everything legally, now you're the one who doesn't have a firearm. Now you're the one whose gun has been confiscated and while you're waiting in line for hours at a time just trying to buy food for your family, you know, you're at risk of being robbed, you're at risk of being murdered. We have people in Venezuela right now who are being killed while they're standing in the line at the grocery stores. And it's become, people have become immune to the violence because it is so endemic that when someone gets robbed, they get shot right there in front of them, the line keeps moving forward. People don't, they don't, they don't scatter, they don't run away. They, they, they just keep waiting for their turn to buy food. It is, uh, you know, in, in, in I guess that, that Hobbesian phrase, life has become nasty, brutal, and short. Uh, in these places where, you know, legal gun ownership has been banned. They should make it illegal to kill people in grocery store lines. I think that would help. I'm, I'm sure Maduro's uh, working on that right <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah. And by the way, in Australia, they're actually getting ready for another round of gun control laws, which kind of tells me that that first round, the one that supposedly worked so well, didn't work so well after all. You mean people might still have them? Uh, apparently the criminals are somehow able to still get them. <laughs> Crazy. It's the weirdest thing, right? We're crazy. Yeah. It's absolutely crazy. So bring us up to date on the things that are happening here, federally, at the state level for California, but also the Bay Area has some interesting things that they're attempting to do. Cool sure. Well, look, you've got places like Sunnyvale, California, uh, which instituted last year uh, both a magazine ban. So in California, magazines over 10 rounds uh, have been banned since the early 1990s. But if you owned them, then you could keep them. Sunnyvale last year said, no, you can't do that anymore. Doesn't matter if you've owned them for decades, you can't own them anymore. Um, we also saw uh, in the uh, Bay Area Alameda County uh, a lawsuit over a, uh, a gun store that wanted to open up. And the county said, no, you can't. They, they took this to court. Ultimately, I think they, uh, they got a successful resolution, but there's been so much hostility. Uh, really from the, you know, going back decades, even before NRA News signed on, but one of the first stories I remember covering was Prop H in San Francisco, which was a handgun ban. Uh, and it passed. It ultimately was invalidated by the uh, state Supreme Court in California. But there is, a, what, you know, there is so much hostility towards gun ownership here. At the same time, you also have a, a really strong community of gun owners and Second Amendment supporters who are awfully beleaguered right now because it seems like every day their rights are just being winnowed away. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of things going on locally uh, at the Bay Area, at the state level. You have the Safety for All initiative, which is going to be on the ballot in November. I, I look at the Safety for All initiative, uh, I, I think it's going to make people safe the same way the Affordable Care Act made health care affordable. Oh, yeah. Which is to say, awesome not. not. Right, exactly. <laughs> so these are all laws that are aimed at people who are already trying to obey the laws. Um, if you want to purchase ammunition uh, under the Safety for All initiative, uh, you would have to, and this also was uh, uh, passed by uh, the legislature this year, uh, you will no longer be able to go online and order ammunition uh, and have it sent to you. Now you have to go get a background check performed every time you purchase ammunition. Can't buy it online anymore. So if you live 20 or 30 miles from a gun store, you're gonna have to go 20 or 30 miles to the gun store, see what they have in stock, which 
given the you know the the amount of ammo that's being sold right now and the shortages that we're seeing, you could drive 30 miles and find that they're out of the ammo that you need. But what does that do for a carbon footprint? I mean, all of that extra <laughs> mileage for driving, right? You know, I, it hurts the environment. They should just let us have bullets. You're probably going to have to have a, maybe you know actually you shouldn't have said that <laughs> because now you're probably going to have to pay a carbon, a carbon tax yes. every time you purchase ammunition if you live more than 10 miles away from a gun store. <laughs> don't don't give them any ideas, Chris. They'll run with them here. <laughs> yes, they will. And so, so th that will actually drive up the cost, reduce the, their objective is always to drive up the cost and make it cost prohibitive to, to buy the ammunition because they think if they can't outlaw the guns because of the Second Amendment, then they're going to try to make it too expensive to use them. Right. The problem is, though, they're, they're, they're aiming, again, at the people who are trying to obey the laws um, as opposed to going after the people who are actually committing the crimes. You know, what we know about violent crime in this country is that a disproportionate amount is committed by a very small number of individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, FBI estimates that uh, in most urban areas, about 80% of the crime is committed by about 20% of the gang population. Mm -hmm. So nationwide, you're looking at 80% of our violent crime being committed by about 250,000 individuals, as opposed to the 90 to 100 million legal gun owners. So why on earth would we focus our efforts and our attention and our laws at the 90 million legal gun owners than the quarter million people who are prohibited in many cases. They're already convicted felons. They can't legally possess a round of ammunition, much less a firearm. Right. Why aren't we focusing our efforts there? And I'm just saying, if you thin the herd of criminals, like for example, if some of them get defended against their attacks, they tend to do less crime if they're dead. They do, but I don't want to see that happen, either, honestly. <laughs> no, honestly, if you could avoid it. But, you sure, know, but. So here's the thing. You look at what's going on. Uh, I just read this uh, last week, actually. San Bernardino. More homicides in San Bernardino this year than last year when you had a terror attack. Mm -hmm. There have been 150 shootings in San Bernardino this year. I think there have been over 40 homicides. Central California, uh, where San Bernardino is located, the, the U.S. District of Central California, mm -hmm. U.S. Attorney's Office, dead last in the country in terms of federal weapons cases. Why? Why is that? And why don't we ever hear anything about that? Chicago, uh, where they've had over 500 homicides this year, far below the national average in federal weapons prosecutions. You know, Barack Obama has been calling for new gun control laws for ever since he won re-election in 2012. And before. Uh, he was, well, was kind of quiet his first term. And then the second term happened. Uh, we had Sandy Hook in December of 2012. Uh, and that was when President Obama sort of pivoted uh, to gun control. And yet, the number of cases that have been prosecuted by the Department of Justice have continued to decline. Now, that's something that the president could do right now that doesn't involve an executive order, doesn't involve a new gun law. That's just telling prosecutors, go after these cases, make them a priority. And yet, enforce we're not seeing the law. that. And you, you, fully enforce the laws on the books. Now you're talking crazy again. I know. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about some of the different approaches. Like, for example, you, we were talking before the show about Richmond, California. Mm. What's going on there? So Richmond is interesting because Richmond had a really high violent crime rate, huge homicide rate for a number of years. And then um, a few years ago, uh, they decided to implement a program uh, kind of modeled off of a, a program called Ceasefire where you, again, you identify those who are most likely to offend. And those who are most likely to offend are also most likely to be victimized, right? Because criminals are often attacking and killing each other. Mm -hmm. So if you can identify who's in that pool of high-risk offenders, and then you sort of give them the, the carrot and the stick approach. Uh, the carrot is the, the members of their community coming together and say, look, we want to help you. You got to stop shooting each other. But if you stop shooting each other, then we can help you with job training. We can help you maybe get your GED, maybe go to college. What do you want to do to be a success in life? Uh, the stick is, if you don't stop shooting, well, here's the police chief, and here's the county prosecutor, and here's the U.S. attorney, uh, and they're going to throw the book at you and all of your associates, and you won't get the sweetheart plea deals anymore. You will go to prison, federal prison, for as long as we can put you away. Uh, in Richmond, they're actually doing something a little bit different in that they're giving people a stipend. Uh, so they're paying. This is, they've got a lot of headlines of paying people not to commit crimes. That's not exactly what they're doing. Uh, but they are giving individuals a stipend. I think they can earn up to $9,000 for meeting these benchmarks Over and guidelines. Over what period of time? Over like a year. 
okay. uh, to, 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 you know, if, if you go to these counseling classes, if you get your GED, if you make these, these you know, uh, if you make progress, then you can get a stipend in return for that. Um, frankly, I gotta say, as a conservative, if it works, I'd rather pay somebody $9,000 for them to change their life than to pay $40,000 a year to keep them in prison. Right, and if you're actually giving them skills that will allow them to become productive, legally productive members of society, now you're in a situation where they can actually give back. Right. Are there any studies on how that's worked out over the long term, if it's helped recidivism, any of those? So this, this is, I think, one of the issues. Um, it, when, it, when the programs stop, the progress also seems to stop. Uh, this was first done in Boston back in the 1990s, and they focused on juvenile homicides. Uh, one of the things that they realized was that, you know, things like additional background check laws and stuff like that, they weren't going to touch juveniles who were committing homicides because they couldn't legally buy a gun anyway. And they actually saw the homicide rate drop by more than 50% in Boston. But when the program stopped, the homicide rate started climbing back up. Some cities have implemented this or they've attempted to implement it, and it hasn't gone well at all. You have a lot of working parts. You have to have a lot of agencies that are working together and they don't always work well together. Personality conflicts come into play. And the community has to be bought in. Absolutely, and, and two, you have to have that trust between the community and law enforcement, which we are seeing erode in a lot of cities around the country. Especially over the last year, I'm assuming. Right, and so that is a challenge. Uh, undeniably, it's a challenge, but the thing is, it actually works when it's done correctly and when it's implemented properly. There is a dramatic effect, unlike you know, another background check law or a ban on semi-automatic firearms or uh, declaring more guns to be quote unquote assault weapons. Mm -hmm. You know, those are all issues or those are all matters where I think politicians get to say, uh, look, I did something. I don't want politicians to do something. I want politicians to do something that works. Yeah, I agree. It just seems though that even without the money part of the carrot, that the things that we talked about, law enforcement working together, the community trusting one another and being involved and really caring about the conduct within their community, that that's just the recipe, recipe for success regardless if there's money involved or not. Absolutely, and a lot of these programs have been implemented without these stipends uh, being given out and, and awarded. Uh, in Boston, they didn't have any stipends. It really was a matter of letting these individuals know that the community cares about you, you know, here's your principal at the school that you used to attend or the school that you should be attending. Right. Uh, here's a local pastor. Here's your uncle. Uh, here's, you know, your neighbor. And all of them want to see you succeed in life. And they're all there to help you. But you have to stop this destructive behavior. And if you don't, then they're, they're tired of what you're doing. And they love you enough that they, they you know, one way or the other, you're Love gonna, can get you, tough. Right. One way or the other, you're going to stop shooting. It's either going to be with the community support or it's going to be because the community says, we can't have you around anymore because you're killing us. Literally. Literally. And so if people want to find out more about NRA News or they want to find out about the things you're tracking through the various media uh, that you're involved in, is there a website? What's the best way for them to find you? Uh, NRANews.com is the website. That's probably the best place to look. Uh, every day we are live three hours a day. Uh, and we've got some amazing resources there. In addition to uh, NRA News Cam and Company, we have a lot of other fantastic programs, uh, NRA Frontlines uh, featuring uh, Colonel Oliver North going to places where people are basically trying to get out. He goes in and covers what's happening. So he was on the ground in Iraq covering what's going on with ISIS. He's been uh, to Afghanistan, I don't know how many times now. We've also got programs like Love at First Shot, uh, which explores, right, isn't that a great title? Uh, which explores people who are just getting into gun ownership for the first time, tips and tactics. Uh, there are all kinds of programs, whether it's, uh, you know, people who are new to gun ownership, people who have grown up around firearms. I think, I think there's something that'll benefit everybody there. Or people who are just curious. <laughs> Even people who don't like guns, I think, will actually get something out of this program. Awesome. Well, Cam, thanks for joining us. If you'll hold on for just a moment, we'll be back after a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. Some people think that a meeting of conservatives in Silicon Valley could fit in a small room. In fact, when the Conservative Forum was founded in 2003, we did meet in a small room, a coffee shop in San Jose. It doesn't get more grassroots than this. It may surprise you that there are thousands of people right here in Silicon Valley who share your principles of liberty, free markets, and limited government. 
since our humble beginnings in that coffee shop, we've outgrown three meeting halls. From San Jose to Gilroy to Mill Valley, we bring hundreds of people together each month from all over the Bay Area to promote the principles of American liberty. How do we do it? It starts with a stellar lineup of speakers. Speakers like Steve Forbes, Senator Jim DeMint, Dr. Victor Davis Hansen, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, Andrew Breitbart, Pamela Geller, and many others. These speakers passionately articulate our shared principles and remind us why conservatism isn't just the smart choice, it's also the moral choice. Our monthly meetings are only one dimension of the forum. We underwrite The Right Side, a monthly television show on cable access channel KMVT. We also host a monthly constitution discussion group and provide tables at our meetings for more than a dozen local groups who share our love of liberty to promote their specific cause. The Conservative Forum is the premier place in Silicon Valley for conservatives to gather, become invigorated, motivated, and empowered. We welcome guests to our monthly meetings and offer special discounted pricing to first-time visitors. Take a look at our speaker lineup in the coming months and join us to learn why we say liberty is made in America. And that was a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. We've appreciated their sponsorship of the show over the last, this is the fifth season and we're on the downhill slide into the end of the year. But what they're best known for is their speaker series. And that was one of the reasons we were blessed to have Cam in the studio with us this evening because he'll be the speaker this evening at seven o'clock at the IFES Portuguese Hall at 432 Stirling Road, about three minutes from here, right in Mountain View. In October, Dinesh D'Souza, the creator and driving force behind the popular documentary Hillary's America, will be speaking. In November, on the 15th, Dr. Charlie Self, an inspirational speaker and frequent guest as Dr. History on KSFO, will be uh, at the forum. He's also been a guest here, and we enjoyed him tremendously. On December 13th, Nick Adams, founder and director of the Foundation for Liber Liberty for American Greatness, is going to be with us, and that's an organization dedicated to promoting American exceptionalism, yes, they said exceptionalism, and combating anti-Americanism worldwide. He's also a best-selling author, columnist, and commentator. For more information, you can go to theconservativeforum.com uh, to find out about upcoming events, directions, etc. And in closing, I just wanted to remind you to take a look into some of the things that Cam was talking about. He takes a different approach to gun control, gun ownership, and all things firearm related, as well as Patriot related. Um, so look him up either by Googling Cam and Company or by looking up nranews.com or if you have Sirius, you can find him there because this is serious stuff. Uh, in closing, I just want to thank you very much for joining us this evening. I've been your host, Chris Pereja. This has been The Right Side, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the show or in person sometime soon. But if you just can't wait, you can find us at therightsidetv at gmail.com, and we'll get to your questions or catch those flaming darts as quickly as we can. Thanks, and have a great night.